Well, the days are getting cooler. Sunlight's getting shorter. That only means that it's finally getting to that time of the year again where these videos outside are getting shorter and shorter and fewer and fewer. And then we move back inside. So I guess since it's going to get pretty cold here pretty quickly, might as well look at my latest acquisitions before I unfortunately have to pack them away for the year. What I have picked up here for it was like 50 or $60 each is an IBM Model 24 key punching machine and an IBM Model 56 card verifying machine. They look very similar and in fact the Model 24 here is the lower end model of the Model 26 which just simply adds printing. Both of these that I can tell were in use up until about 1981 and then they went into storage and then they went up for sale this year and they were close and well no one else seemed to be really interested so I grabbed them. There has been some signs here that a lot of use has been given to them. Let's take a look around them to see their condition. So like I said, the Model 24 is a little bit different from the Model 26 in that it doesn't have a printing system attached to it. Uh, that would basically be a much larger, more bulbous cover right here for that giant printing mechanism that the Model 29 key punch I have uses. And it would just punch to the top edge of the card as it passes through. Yet, the keyboard here has a switch for the printer. So this is not the original keyboard. At some point there was a Model 26 or they got a spare parts 26 and because the parts are so interchangeable they had to change the keyboard out for some reason. This switch is here, it doesn't do anything at all. Other than that I'm noticing here compared to my Model 29 there is a lot of components to this thing that are very similar. Um, there was even some cards that were stuffed into this thing. These are hmm, CDC part numbers bit curled, they'll iron out. There was a bunch of other cards in there. We'll talk about that stuff in a bit. So the keyboard mechanism that I can tell is pretty much the same thing as the Model 29. So that means there's a lot of contacts into here to clean. And when I mean by contacts, oh boy, there's a lot of contacts in here to clean. Let's take the lid off here and I'll show you a bit more inside. So like I said, mechanically, very similar in here. Like, in comparison to the Model 29, there are a lot of components in here which are damn near identical. I would not be surprised if IBM just reused a whole bunch of these components. There is, however, the same problems that you're running into with the Model 29 that you'll find on this as well. So, all of these nice silver contacts here, all of these are dirty, they're tarnished, they all need to be cleaned up. There is tons and tons and tons of grease, and I'm trying to find some. We're just going to go with this grease here for right now. All that has to be cleaned, replaced, relubricated. I think the motor's seized. It's very tight. The whole thing is incredibly tight. But I do have an oiling port on the motor here, so that's all the same. The power switch is living up here. Um, and lots of chips and stuff hanging out in here. Visually, though, otherwise, very clean in here, not a whole heck of a lot broken. And unfortunately, I say not a whole heck of a lot. I mean, sure, that's going to happen. And then there's that. There's supposed to be little tiny star wheels like this one on these arms here for the program drum. And what someone's done is that they've all gone missing. I suspect what's happened is that someone didn't realize there's a switch right here that just simply unloads the start wheels and allows you to remove the program drum. So they yanked the program drum off after bending this back and as a result those little tiny start wheels have all just scattered everywhere. I'm being cautious not to clean this thing up too much yet because I have to see if they're in here. Other than that, and that means the program drum is completely unusable now. Shame. And yes, it does also use those same pluggable relay modules that we, I had to deal with before in the Model 29. These blasted things, if I can get that plugged back in there, come on, you're keyed. There you go. There. Um, these things here all require their contacts to be pulled out, carefully cleaned, and then re-put back in there because they're also going to be completely tarnished up. But mechanically, while everything else on the Model 29 is pretty much the same, the rest of the electronics are a whole different idea. Uh, remember, the Model 29 is the successor to these key punches here, the Model 24 and the Model 26. As a result, the electronics in them are not necessarily 
as solid state as we're used to. So I'm going to swing our relay frame back here and then we look inside and oh dear. So first thing that I can see here is that we have one, two, three, four stacks of selenium rectifiers. Those are basically the precursors to modern, modern silicon bridge, rect bridge rectifier diodes. We have wax paper capacitors hanging out in the back there. Those all are going to have to be changed. Um, even for the rectifiers here, I don't necessarily trust them. I mean, reefer caps, when they go poof, are um, an awful smell and a kind of a mess. These, on the other hand, you really don't want to be smelling these when these things are smoking and burning up. So those will have to be replaced. I have no idea about those. I'm assuming they're just oil-filled caps, but this is like the 1950s, maybe the 1940s. Oh man, yeah, probably the 1950s, but that means it's going to also predate most regulations on PCBs. So, that's going to be fun. Other than that, highly serviceable. Look at all these little screw terminals here where they just have the resistors and all of that just kind of attached across like that. Very nice to maintain. But, there's a lack of relays on this thing here. And that's not because someone's been pilfering them away. Oh, no, 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 no. There is more going on here. And I just realized there's also a multi-stage capacitor hiding behind this wire harness here. Oh, man. There's a lot in here to take care of. Anyways, no. We're missing relays in here, which I guess you would consider solid state relative to what's actually doing some of the switching in here. Behind this panel here, which is heavily ventilated, you will probably assume that it's going to be more of the power supply. Uh, well, it's a bunch of things. But until then, hold on, let me get the screw off. There. Ready? Reveal time. Yep, it's got tubes in it. These here are your main switching valves, tubes. And look at that. They're also, either they're original, or they're just like this has been well serviced by an IBM technician because they do have original IBM tubes living inside of it. Oh man, so this here is like sure, it's it, it's going to require your preventative maintenance and greasing when you're doing this here, but just this here alone having to bring up all of this this on its own is a full restoration even though I have the full table and the keyboard assembly and all that here right now. But other than that, there's not a whole hell of a lot else to it. I mean, we got some fancy relays there, but no, no, everything else is otherwise the same. Here's your badge plate, by the way. All right, now let's move on over to the card verifier. This here is the uh, card verifier. And at first glance, it looks exactly the same as the card punch. But then you look a little bit closer and you realize, well, there's one major change. That button is now just a light gemstone right here and there is a light that's hiding behind there. Uh, other than that, that looks all the same. Even this looks all the same, though we don't have that switch here now. This doesn't have printing, isn't that obvious? Let's take this lid off here and see what's going on underneath. Right, and with the lid removed you can clearly see there is a lot more going on inside. It's also worth noting that the back doors for the relay cat enclosures were both missing, so whatever. Anyways, inside of here Seems relatively the same until you look around and you hear and you realize there's a lot more going on. There is a hammer in here, but it's not being used for punching. So the idea here is that you would punch your cards on that. And then the document that you are punching from and the card would go into the would come over to here. You'd feed the card in, and you would then go and enter the data in character for character on the keyboard. The hammer would fire, but instead of actually punching the card again, you have these little tiny contacts here, yay, more contacts to clean, that would uh, either pass through or be blocked by the holes in the card. So you are now trying to match the holes in the card to what you've entered in on the keyboard. And if it's good, um, it'll pass straight through and it'll notch the end of the card. Uh, However, if you go to pass to a point where, let's say, you push the T and there's actually a V in that location, this light here will turn on. And yes, it's one of these ridiculous IBM light bulbs. Put that back in here. There we go. But that light will turn on. 
Now you'll have two more attempts to correct that. So maybe, no, it's not T, it's actually a D. Well, the light stays on, so no. Uh, okay, K. So what's going to happen here is that it's not going to notch the end of the card? Question mark there, i got to double check on that. But instead what it's going to do is that where the printer is, we have another solenoid here, which is actually going to notch that vertical column there to indicate that there was a data entry error on that spot. Either the verifier made the error, the machine made the error when it was being punched, or the operator made the error when transferring from the document to the punch card. That way there, you can then go back and just say, oh, okay, whatever, I can go correct that, so you send it back off. This is only a verification device. It cannot punch cards. So it's such a strange device. It's kind of like, okay, it's not at all like a checksum, but it's, it, it's verifying to make sure that the data that's being transferred through it is valid. Uh, as a result though, however, this is full of a different style of chips, little half moon things going on here, D-shaped chips, and those are all over the place. Why is there a relay in here? Uh, oh, hey. Cool, okay. Um, I wonder how you managed to get yourself out of there. Can I just put you back in? Yes. Pop you back in. Uh, and yeah, speaking of relays, there are considerably more relays in here. We actually have more resistors going on in here. There's the switch here, T or N. And if I swing this down, well, this is almost the same, but now we have a lot more selenium rectifiers hanging out down here. All those are really doing are just acting as diodes, I believe. Um, uh, God, there's more wax paper caps in here. There's actually one in here with a resistor tied to it. Okay, so that needs to be cleaned up as well. It does also have more tubes. What a surprise. And what I find interesting is that these terminals here, I think, yes, they're just plugs. So I can't say that it's all soldered in, but if you want to remove this, I guess it's just plugs into here and you can reconfigure it by using little plugs. That's interesting. Cool. Oh yeah, here's the badge for it, by the way. Since I'm probably not going to be able to get to either of these before the end of the year here, um, the very least what I want to do for this video is I just want to see if I can get the tubes to light. We should be able to do that without having to do it destructively. I feel like if I were to plug this in right now, it would be nothing but problems. There's so much greasing and work to do on this thing, capacitor replacement. Eh, it's not fun. By the way, if you're one of those folks who are asking what's going on with the Model 29 key punch, it's been, what, two years since I got that? Well, it's clean, it's mostly running now, but it's currently dealing with hammer issues. The hammers are all seized in place right now. Um, I've been trying to soak that in a mix of acetone and automatic transmission fluid in an attempt to try to free them up, and then maybe I can get back to working on that. Until then, it's just kind of hidden away with um, fresh uh, penetrating oil soaking away to try and free up the last few bits of the hammers. And there's still contacts hanging out in it. Anyways, so for this here, I'd rather not plug this thing in directly to the wall. So instead, we're going to load limit it. And that's right, we're going to be using the dim bulb tester again. And before we go too far on that there, I'm going to take this wire nut off and separate these wires for the motor because otherwise it's going to just try and start the motor and just light the bulb, which is not what I want. I can probably leave those just hanging out there for now. Put a cap on that. All right, let's start off with a bulb. Okay, 40 watt bulb. And we'll set you to watts. Nothing. Oh, power switch? Oh, yep, that's what it was. So that's gone down to zero. This is full brightness, and we're at basically 37 or 38 watts. So it's just dumping all of it right now into the light bulb. Could mean a short. Could just mean it wants more than that. It's actually 
Ah, it's not decreasing. Okay, let's go up a different size bulb here. Uh, 100 watt. Seems about things better. Cool, and the voltage is decreasing. Or is it increasing? It's hanging out around. What's the power factor on that? One. Okay. Okay, so it's sitting around 66 watts. It's got about 70 volts going in, so we should have tube blowing. Tubes glowing. And we do have tubes glowing. Okay. Do I want to be ambitious and increase the voltage on this thing? And the answer to the 100 watt bulb is a distinctive no, stop, stop what we're doing and we'll just have to work from there. Um, it got brighter and then it promptly got dimmer again and then the keyboard used to reset and then it stopped resetting. And I looked here, and this is a 2 amp fuse, and this 2 amp fuse is, uh, can you see it in there? Yeah. So the 2 amp fuse went uh, open, even at like 80 volts. Whoops. So there is definitely something shorted, probably one of those capacitors. So that'll have to be changed, and then we'll have to do this all over again. In the meantime, I have a spare 2 amp cartridge fuse. So I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to put that back in there. This is the chip bucket, by the way. It's fairly cleaned out at this point. And unfortunately, I don't see the star wheels hiding in here either. Also, there's also a lot of this tape. That's just around here. Like, it doesn't really do anything anymore, so. Okay, all that was doing was just hold that together. So there were a couple other odds and ends that came with the unit, many of which I'm going to consider to be mementos, because they don't seem to be directly related to this unit at all, with the exception of these punch cards. Um, these just look like business entries. There we go. Um, they have not been well kept. Oh, hey, there's a batch header card here. Um, I don't mind having decks of cards like this around because for the most part the information that's stored on these are now is pretty much redundant. Not only that, but many of the companies or individuals that these are actually created for or from are either out of business or they're dead at this point. But, well, there's not much punch card stock left. I've heard the Computer History Museum has tried to make their own cards and they've had poor success. It comes down to paperweight, the thickness, and a bunch of other variables. If there's a couple of good unused cards in here, it's worth keeping those for that. These are the programming wheels for both the punch and the verifier. These are interchangeable between both. You can actually use these in the 29 as well. Huh. This one here is labeled from Canadian data. So really all this does is that it's just kind of a, a macro on a, on a card. The card is then wrapped around the cylinder, and those little star wheels fall into these holes here to control advancement of the card through the unit, like for field entry, uh, pre-programmed data for like fields that are always exactly the same, so you might as well just have them on here and it'll punch it out for you. And similar things like that. What's on this one here? This is just a regular, uh, this is an IBM 5081 card, okay. And then there's other mementos that are in here as well. It's interesting that, well, the previous owner of this had nothing to do with what I'm holding in my hand here. This is stuff that came along from uh, the previous owner's previous owner. So this here is a work order form, and it seems to imply consistently here the name MAI Canada. And in fact, these envelopes they got here, which contain additional documentation, same thing, MAI Canada, what is that? 1665 West Broadway, Vancouver? This is a name I've heard of before. From where? Oh, they made the Basic 4 systems. So, it's entirely possible that all of this here is associated with these, and these came out of MAI Canada, because for whatever reason they were using them in their offices? I mean, these are a bit dated, but I mean, card punching was 
relatively unchanged, even with the addition of extra characters with the 029. Um, so why not? Sure, I guess you could continue to use these. There's also these two IBM intra-office envelopes, which inside of both of them contain card gauges. So the idea here is that if you were having alignment or registration issues, you would place your card down on top of this. And each of these uh, numbered marks here, or holes, should line up with the punched marks on the card. If they aren't, there's an alignment issue and you're supposed to correct that. This is 80 column. I've seen these before. I already actually own one of these. This one, on the other hand, is special because I've never seen it. This here is a 96 column card gauge. This is that stupid, compact, high density uh, punch card that came out with, I believe, the IBM System 3. Um, like, it did hold more data, but ultimately what it was found out to be was that these here were far easier to work with. When you start making card holes this small, you begin running into weird issues. So, cool, two more card gauges. There was also in here a single sheet of microfiche that I can tell is not pertaining to anything for the key punches or MAI or anything like that. But there was also these flow charting templates. So these ones here seem to be fairly generic flow charts. And then there's this one here which seems to call itself Hypo, which has a different set of flowchart templates. Strange knowing that there was a time when you could just write your code out on paper and you were using symbols to designate how each process and operation was being performed. I don't think you do that at all with modern programming, do we? And yeah, like I said, the uh, two yellow mailers here just contain schematics and documentation that pertain to both the 56 and the 024. Uh, I have checked on BitSavers. Um, this is all scanned and documented already, so it's nice to have hard copies of a lot of this stuff, even if I have to figure out where most of it is on this. The last of what I got here is, again, mostly just mementos, so I am assuming that's some sort of alignment tool or spacer ring. We have a Selectric type ball that's living in here. I have some pins. This one is AIX. Hey, cool. And you are OS2 warp. I see another one over there. US2 is again. Yep, you're warp as well. Oh, those are really cute. I love those pins. Thank you, whoever. Whoever you were, thank you very much, sir. Um, these are right protection rings for uh, nine track tapes. So the key phrase here is no ringy, no righty. Um, I'm not entirely sure what this, to this tool is used for. Is this a file? No, it's not a file. It's sharpened on the end too, like it's a screwdriver. What are you? Is there a part number? No, there is not. Okay, interesting. And then I got these little two badges right here. I want to. It's like a plug, a plug board plug, something like that. So here's the badge for an IBM 2311 disk drive. And this, which is an IBM 2260 display station. So this here was one of the early IBM CRT terminals. I believe it has a delay, a delay line in it. I have to double check on that one there. But um, these are really cool. These are actually really adorable. I'm not going to lose those. And speaking of losing things, while I was doing a little bit of cleaning and tidying, I found three of those missing star wheels. So, okay, that leaves me with, I think, five now. There's still many more star wheels missing. I'm hoping that in the very tight corners of that machine, these are hiding in there. So I am going to very carefully put those back in so I do not lose them. So, what now? Well, of course, like I've already mentioned, the, both of these need to be cleaned and fully restored before they're going to be usable. It's interesting that within the last seven years, eight years, I've gone from not having any reason to need key punching equipment to I have punch card readers, I have card punchers, I have a verifier, I have stacks of cards, and I have computers that are capable of inputting data as punch cards. Unfortunately, I am rapidly running out of space, so this stuff here is starting to become the catalyzing initiative for me to try and move out of this place and find a place with more space. Then I can actually have these set up and be usable. 
But for now, um, I'll do a final tidy. I'll bag them and I'll cover them up and I'll get them ready for the winter. I mean, sure, they'll freeze, but whatever. They're, there's not much damage that's going to happen to them at this point. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I will try and do more videos on these in the far future. But I hope you enjoyed touring around them because I don't think there's any other videos on the 26s much less the 56 online. So uh, yeah, there you go. And until next time, have a good one.